This video is about the switching speeds of field effect transistors. It corresponds to section 32.5 of the Applied Analog Electronics book. And what we're going to be looking at is what's called the gate charge model. So let's take a quick look at uh, what we want to do. I'm going to be looking at just a single low side NFET. It's going to be connected to ground. It's going to have a gate control. And I'm going to put a load resistor here, just a simple resistive load. And let's put it up to 5 volts. All right. So um, what we want to look at is what's the voltage here on the drain? How fast does it change? Uh, when does it change? We're also going to be interested in looking at the current through the load. Okay. And, of course, the control value here is going to be the voltage on the gate. Now, in order to uh, increase the clarity of the signals we're going to look at, I'm not going to drive this gate directly with um, function generator. I'm going to run it through a resistor here and take that from the function generator. The function generator here is actually going to be a square wave or pulse between 0 volts and 5 volts. And for the load resistor, I'm going to use 100 ohms. I'm also going to put 100 ohms here. And the reason for that is to be able to see what's going on at the gate because the 100 ohms here is going to limit the amount of current I can get from the function generator. And as a result, the capacitor here is going to charge much more slowly than usual. Um, if I didn't put a slowing down resistor here to limit the current, um, this signal here would change very rapidly and would be hard to observe with the oscilloscopes um, because the oscilloscopes we're using here, the Analog Discovery 2, has a maximum sampling rate of 100 mega samples per second. So I, I want to slow things way down so I can get a nice clean signal um, and see what's happening as the gate changes. It's going to be the same sort of phenomenon that we would see in the real world without this because there's still some current limitation from whatever your source is for driving the, tr the uh, gate of the transistor. But I exaggerated it to get a clearer image. Okay, so let's take a look at what that gives us. So we've got 100 ohm gate and drain resistors. That's the particular NFET I was using. Um, different NFETs will, of course, have different size uh, gates, different speeds, but the phenomenon is going to be about the same no matter what. This purple line here, that is the voltage on the gate. Now, if we were thinking of the gate as just a simple capacitor, which is okay to a first approximation, we would expect to see an RC charging curve with 100 ohms and whatever the capacitance is. And so we would expect to see something that curves. This part here looks a lot like the sort of shark fin we expect to see, and this part here looks kind of like it. But there's these weird bumps that happen in the gate voltage, and we'll get into a moment where those are from. Um, those bumps actually are important for the model we're going to be looking at. A simple RC timing model is a little hard to fit to this because, quite frankly, there are other things going on. It isn't just a capacitor for the gate. One very important thing that's missing from the schematic here is that there is a parasitic capacitance between the gate and the drain. That's known as the Miller capacitance. And that Miller capacitance is actually largely what is responsible for the weird behavior we're seeing with that gate signal. Because what happens is that when the drain-to-source voltage suddenly drops, 
that drop in voltage is coupled through the capacitor back to the gate. And what happens is that the current that would have been uh, raising the gate voltage is instead going into that charging of the capacitor. And so we end up with a flat part here where the gate voltage essentially doesn't change while the drain voltage is making its transition. This is known as the Miller Plateau based on the Miller capacitance. And you can see it to some extent even on the turning off of the transistor. So what I had here as the input was a one microsecond pulse. So went up to five volts, ran across, came back down at one microsecond. And so we have this charging and then at one microsecond discharging. And at about the same place on the charging and discharging curves, we have this Miller Plateau, which happens where the drain voltage makes its transition. Um, and the reason that the Miller Plateau doesn't look exactly the same on top and bottom is that we have different charge and discharge curves, and we have different uh, turn on and turn off rates, so that the voltages the slopes are different on the two sides. We're not going to get exactly the same coupling through the capacitor. And usually you see a cleaner Miller Plateau on turning on the transistor than you see on turning it off. Um, there's another weird bump here on the turning on. That is due to when the transistor is off, which is what we're starting in down here with the gate at zero volts, when we start the, trans the gate voltage rising, but haven't turned on the transistor yet, we have capacitive coupling to the drain. And so that rising voltage here causes a rising voltage on the drain, which we see as a negative current through the load. We're raising the voltage above the five volts that's on the other side of that resistor. So we have this little bump going the wrong way. And then when the transistor turns on, we get up to the threshold voltage here and the transistor turns on, then we rapidly drop the voltage. That rapid drop of the voltage being coupled back through the Miller capacitance now flattens out the gate. And then once we've turned the transistor all the way on, there's, there's no change in the drain voltage, there's no uh, flattening of the gate voltage anymore. All the current now goes into back into charging the gate capacitance. Turning off, the same sort of phenomenon. We discharge until we get to the point where we're no longer turning the transistor on and then the voltage here rises. And Now this is rising through the 100 ohm resistor so it's not going to rise as fast as this fell. Um, the voltage rises and that's going to cause uh, the current through the load to drop. It flattens out the uh, gate voltage a little bit here through coupling back through that Miller capacitance, this raising, rising spike together with the, the current that's pulling the uh, gate down. Um, it doesn't cancel as well because this is a slower rise than this fall. And then finally, once we've got the transistor all the way off, then we're going back to RC just discharge curve. Okay, so I've given you sort of rough pictures here of what's going on. What's this got to do with figuring out the speed? Well, it turns out that if we divide this picture into three parts, there's the part from when you start the pulse to where the transistor turns on. Then there's the part from uh, basically across the Miller Plateau when the output is changing, we're changing the value on the transistor, and then finally there's this last RC tar charging time. It turns out that each of those regions has roughly a constant charge. We've got the current into the gate. If you integrate that current over time, you get a charge. So the area under the curve here from... Now let me grab a pen here and mark the regions. 
the region here has a roughly a constant charge no matter what current you're driving whatever you know however long it takes to get the point that it turns on here is after it's accumulated enough charge on the gate and the amount of charge there um, is known as the source charge and then from here to here we're basically waiting for the drain to make its full transition the charge there is roughly constant it's called the drain charge and then the final charge here depends on what voltage we're taking the uh, output up to um, so it's not a constant but for any given sort of target voltage up here is roughly constant and that is the total charge and these three constants can give you um, a good estimate of how long it'll take your transistor to turn on because you can say okay the transistor will, won't turn on until I've accumulated this much charge well if I've got a constant current input I can say okay with that much current I can just divide out you know, how much time does it take to get that much charge with that much current um, and then the same thing here if I've got let's say I've got something that's got you know 10 milliamp current to, to drive my gate well QS divided by 10 milliamps gives me how long it takes to get to this point QD divided by 10 milliamps tells me how long it takes to get to this point and if I want to know how long it takes to get all the way to the end here I just look at what's the total charge um, we don't often care about the total charge here because once we've turned the transistor all the way on this further charging isn't really anything that helps us um, except for maybe a little bit of noise tolerance it is however to some extent a disadvantage in that when we want to turn the thing off we have to discharge the total charge to be finished here and we again have the same regions here there's the total charge to discharge and then this region is going to be the uh, QD and then we have the QS here for the um, final charge so we've got um, we can go through an analysis whether we've got an RC circuit or a uh, current limitation we can go through and do fairly accurate uh, computations of how long it'll take to turn on the transistor turn off the transistor quite often the parameter we're most interested in is how fast are we going to make this transition and that depends largely on uh, QD and the other one is how fast um, how long does it take before we start making the transition and that largely depends on QS so we've got those two parameters tend to tell us a lot about what the shape of the edge is going to be here because our turning off the rising time of the output depends here mainly on uh, that 100 ohm resistor that we were using as a load it's not quite as dependent on QD if we've got a situation where uh, this has got a very very small resistance so a very um, high current situation that may no longer be the main limitation on um, how fast the transition happens is, is the RC timing of that load um, it may depend more on the characteristics of the transistor itself um, it'll be useful for you to actually build a circuit very similar to the one that I have here you don't have to add a capacitor here that's the Miller capacitance that's built into the transistor itself inherent in there being a field effect transistor um, and just try doing a measurement like this to see what sort of characteristics your transistor has you should be able to um, by slowing down the, the uh, charging of the gate capacitance here you should be able to get a pretty clean Miller plateau and uh, plot how fast your transistor turns on and you can find these um, source and drain charges and the total charge for some usually fairly large voltage on the gate um, on data sheets for your transistors so you don't have to necessarily measure them yourself you can get them from the data sheet and do some some quick back of the envelope calculations 
if I drive this thing with a you know something that's limited to 10 milliamps, how long will it take to turn on? And if that's too long, then you know 10 milliamp driver is not going to be powerful enough. I need to put in a more powerful driver in order to switch this transistor as fast as I need to. So the um, looking at sort of particularly QD, the, the drain capacitance or the drain charge here, and um, the current that you can provide from your driver is a really good way of sizing your driver to make sure that you've gonna, you're have you going to be able to switch your transistors fast enough. And that's really about it for the gate charge model. Um, have fun with it.